boost hand hygiene with healthy skin. We know hand hygiene is the single most effective way to help prevent the spread of infections. We also know the essential role healthcare providers play in keeping us safe. That's why it's important to protect healthcare workers' hands with products that help stop the spread of bacteria and nourish the skin. Medline's complete portfolio of Spectrum and Sterilium brand hand sanitizers are proven to reduce bacteria and moisturize the skin. Our mission is to take care of the hands of those that matter most. We greatly appreciate all that you do. You're listening to The 5 Second Rule, brought to you by APIC, the Association for Professionals in Infection Control and Epidemiology. Together with our nearly 16,000 members, we strive to create a safer world through the prevention of infection. Join us while we talk to infection preventionists and other experts to learn the truth about some common myths related to the risk of infection and to get tips to keep yourself and the people around you safe from infection. So Sylvia, as a fellow Metro rider here in the DC area, have you ever thought about all the things that you touch from the time that you wake up in the morning to the time that you go to work? Because you've got your own private space, you're at home, right? and then you move into public transportation land, and that's where things get a little you know, dirty, truly dirty. Yeah. So have you ever really thought about from all those different things that you're touching along the way by the time you get to the office? I actually have, and you're right. If you stop and think about all of the different people getting on the metro in the morning, you're standing in a closed, confined space, you're holding on to rails, you're touching your Metro card. Uh, I have thought about it, and it kind of grosses me out when I think about it. And then I get to the office, and the first thing I do anyway is use the hand sanitizer on my desk. And then as soon as I can get to a sink, I do basic soap and water. So that's what I do. What do you do? I definitely reach for the hand sanitizer almost immediately. But one of the things that I'm now thinking about, which I think so many people have that same problem, is if I'm on the Metro, I like to think that I I read on the Metro as much as I can, but I also am on my phone. So after I've touched all of those handrails, I've, I've put my Metro card on the same, you know, piece as I go through the turnstile as everyone else that has touched their Metro card there. I'm also on my phone, whether it's playing a game or I'm True. going through, you know, social media accounts. And so even though I've washed my hands when I get to the office or I've used hand sanitizer, because we're going to go through that in a second, difference between alcohol based hand sanitizer and hand washing with your soap and water is I'd still all those germs are probably still on my phone. So I might have just pumped a little hand sanitizer in my hand. I'm going to pick that phone right back up again. And, you know, what have I I've almost made my my hand sanitizer efforts a moot point. Yeah, I hadn't thought of that, but you're absolutely right. That's just as contaminated. Oh my God, we have so much to talk about today on the Five Second Rule Show. I'm Sylvia Quevedo. I'm Hannah Andrews. And if you haven't gotten the theme of today's episode already, it is around hand hygiene and all things that your hands might be touching and what hand hygiene really is. And why it's so important. And our guest today, we are thrilled and honored to have Dr. Elaine Larson with us. Dr. Larson is the Anna C. Maxwell Professor Emerita and Special Lecturer at Columbia University School of Nursing, and she was the Professor of Epidemiology at Columbia University Mailman School of Public Health. She is the immediate past Editor-in-Chief of the American Journal of Infection Control and just an all-around giant. Rock star. Rock star in infection prevention and control. Welcome, Dr. Larson. Well, thank you. It's great to be here. So, it would be fun to have this conversation. Indeed. You, um, I'll just say it. Will we call her the queen of hand hygiene? I, I think I would. I mean, she definitely, I think numerous studies out there going back to the 80s, just looking at trends in her own facility and realizing, well, what are these healthcare providers really carrying around on their hands? And are those really the sources of the infections that are being passed around this facility? And so when I think of hand hygiene, I immediately go to Dr. Elaine Larson. Yeah, me too. Dr. Larson, you heard us talking about public transportation. So we're going to get into the importance of hand hygiene and healthcare. Uh, just can't state that enough. But what do you recommend for Hannah and myself as we 
traverse the world of, or ex- at least the D.C. metropolitan area on public transportation in terms of hand hygiene. Any advice for us? Yeah, sure. I mean, you know, it's interesting because uh, maybe a year or so ago, there was a big splash in New York City also about all the bugs that were on the subway, you know, the handrails and all this stuff. And, of course, they are pretty dirty. But if you think about it, it's probably not that much different than anything else we touch because even if you clean something, as soon as you touch it again, when you and I shake hands, for example, we actually exchange about 10,000 germs with each other. So the important thing is to try to minimize the number of transient germs that you pick up when you're um, in the public, and especially if you've got a cold or something. So you're on the right track with uh, carrying around a hand sanitizer. And a sanitizer, as you know, is an alcohol-based product. It doesn't require any soap. It doesn't require a sink. No paper towels, so you can use it anywhere. So uh, that's the huge advantage with sanitizers. You see them now often, don't you, on people's purses and hanging off of belts and so forth. Mm -hmm. So it's really become uh, part of our system to be able to clean your hands right away. So... Hannah mentioned this uh, a few seconds ago, but I remember those old commercials where you had to make a decision between paper or plastic at the supermarket. And there were so many things to consider. Oh, my gosh, I want to do the right thing. What do I do? And of course, now we bring our own bags. But I'm thinking that is a question, right, Hannah? What's best, alcohol-based or soap and water? Can you... Can you elaborate for at least the public out there and maybe some of our colleagues in the healthcare space? Yeah, sure. I mean, hand washing with soap and water and sanitizing your hands are really two different purposes. Hand washing with soap and water doesn't kill any germs, but it mechanically removes them because they rinse down, rinse down the sink. And the paper towels that you use for drying your hands or the, you know, the air dryers um, are also, also sort of kill more of those germs or remove them. But they don't kill any, anything. They just remove it. Alcohol hand sanitizer actually kills germs so that if it, you're in a place where, let's say you've got a cold or it's the flu season and you're on the subway again um, and you need something quickly to kill those germs, that's when you can use a, san- a hand sanitizer. So they're totally different. One removes, physically removes germs. The other actually kills them. So is it safe to say that when in doubt, the hand sanitizer is really the way to go? That's your surefire bet of of getting rid of the stuff on your hands? Well, you know, I I don't think uh, for normal, healthy people in the community, you don't have to, uh, you just have to keep your hands clean. We all have our own germs that live on us. And we are used to them, and they're friendly to us, and they help us, actually. Uh, So we don't want to necessarily remove our own normal germs. So the hand, the soap will physically remove things that we pick up in general. But I, I guess what I'm saying is you can't always get to a sink. And let's say that you're in, you know, in the car with a baby who vomits all over you or you have to change a diaper or whatever. You're not going to stop the car, walk to a sink, etc. Hopefully you're not driving the car while that happens. (laughs) But you need an alternative. And these sanitizers are add a huge benefit to our armamentarium against germs. Now, I want to go back to something that you had said earlier, because you were talking about the air dryers and the paper towels. And there are sort of differing research studies about which one is the more appropriate route in terms of infection prevention. And I'm when we were doing a bit of research for this episode, there really were some articles that said, you know, paper towels carry more germs. But then you also have the air dryers and some of the more recent ones that people have probably seen where you're kind of putting your hands in and out of it. So there is sort of a basin underneath it that those are the ones that are spreading germs up to 10 feet away from the dryer. So depending on which dryer you're using, sometimes it's only about a two foot radius, but some of these newer ones are upwards of 10 feet. So would love to get some clarification on, you know, really the use of a paper towel versus those air dryers. Because I know a lot of people are also trying to be mindful of 
the waste component of it too, which is, you know, really, really big right now. Yeah. No, there's probably waste either way because the air dryers also take, you know, uh, some energy. But um, actually the paper towels coming out of the dispenser are essentially sterile. They're, they're not dirty unless they're sitting around, you know, um, on, which sometimes happens. Paper towels are, have an advantage of continuing to mechanically remove the germs. Um, the air dryers, you're right, they do disperse organisms, but honestly, there's no research to show that that's uh, that dangerous. So I, I think it sort of depends on where you are. The thing you don't want to do is you don't want to share cloth towels with people. So in households, people do sometimes share towels, and they share normal flora. So that's not a problem. But if somebody in the family has a skin infection or something, and you know it's going to spread. So that's how there have been outbreaks, for example, in football teams because they've shared towels and then they end up with methicillin-resistant staph aureus or some other kind of an infection. So bottom line, don't share, don't share cloth towels with people. Um, avoid that unless you have to in your family or something. But um, the paper towels do remove more organisms, but they do cause waste. So you know, there's there's no perfect solution, um, but if you don't have a choice, then you can always air dry your hands, but I don't think that's ever going to happen, that people don't use the air dryers. If they do, they wa- wipe it on their clothes. <laughs> so, Dr. Larson, I mean, point well taken for most of us. Um, we have our healthy flora. Most of us in the community have, I'd like to think, adequate immune systems where we can maybe withstand some of the onslaught of these bugs. But let's talk about hand hygiene in the healthcare setting, which is critical. And we've heard in various publications, I know you having worked with the American Journal of Infection Control, we're hearing statistics like 40% of healthcare workers wash their hands when they're supposed to. Can you speak to yeah. our healthcare worker colleagues that are listening to the show in terms of we all want to do the right thing? So this is about what are your thoughts on the low compliance and why that might be? Sure. And, you know, I mean, uh, to tell you the truth, that's what's bugging me most in my whole career is um, how how we help healthcare workers to do the right thing with hand hygiene because They all want to do the right thing. Nobody's purposely saying, uh, I'm not going to do it. So I think that some of the answer is with human factors engineering and try to figure out how to set up systems to make it easier and easier for people to do the right thing and harder and harder for people to do the wrong thing. So some of it is perhaps a technical solution, like how can we get sinks and monitoring and reminders and things to to work. Um, Part of it is a cultural change, um, but I think a lot of it has to do with just helping the healthcare worker be mindful of when a hand hygiene episode should occur and then making it really easy for them to have it happen. So can we remind everyone when that should happen, Dr. Larson? Sure. Now you're talking about in a healthcare setting, right? Correct. Correct. Okay, yeah, well, the World Health Organization has five moments of hand hand hygiene. So the first is before touching a patient, and then after touching a patient, then after touching the patient's surroundings, before doing an aseptic technique, and um, after contact with blood and body fluids. So the idea is any time, first of all, before you touch a patient to protect the patient, and then in between so that you prevent spreading from one patient's body site to another, and then after the end, which protects the patient and yourself. So uh, one of the challenges, I think, for healthcare workers, talking about the lower compliance rate, is that a lot of these activities sort of um, follow one another in sequence. So you may have five moments of hand washing, but they'll all be occurring kind of uh, sequentially. And really, if we did it separately with each of those five moments, 
a nurse may, or a physician, or anybody touching patients may have to do hand hygiene 60, 70, 80 times a day, and that's not going to happen. So the trick is helping people not just know the opportunities, but also um, exactly when to make it the most efficient and, and reduce the spread of infection the most. Now, going back to, you know, putting sort of your research hat on and all of the research that you've done in this area, you know, I think we've we've made the point so far that it truly is the most effective way for preventing infections, and it is so important to patient safety. Could you elaborate a little bit on that? Because I think just, you know, throwing some statistics out there and, and the research that you've done in this area, because I think also there's sort of confusion of, well, why do I have to wash my hands now I'm about to put gloves on? Different things like that, um, I think, would be really important to share here. Sure. You know, it's interesting because early in my career, when I was a nurse in a surgical intensive care unit, uh, we noticed that hand washing was not um, practiced very often. So I went to the head of the department and I said, oh, this is terrible. People aren't washing their hands. And he said, so what? What's the evidence that hand hygiene makes a difference. And I was appalled, but I started thinking about it, and I thought, you know, I don't really know the evidence. So over the years, we did a couple of systematic reviews of the literature to see what is the evidence for a causal link between hand hygiene and infections. And in the community, there's a huge body of research to show that um, hand washing, when it's done frequently and well, can reduce about 30% of um, GI infections and about 30% of respiratory infections in the community. Now, in healthcare, it's a little harder to show the exact uh, amounts, uh, you know, the exact percentage that you can reduce because they're, the patients in the hospital are immunosuppressed, they're very sick, they are more prone to infections. But it's pretty clear from modeling that um, you can reduce quite a a number of of infections with proper hand hygiene. So really the question is how to get people to do it. Now, really quickly, when it comes to, you know, asking or ensuring that healthcare workers are washing their hands, one of the things that we continue to state on all of our episodes is infection prevention is everybody's business. And a lot of the materials that APIC releases to consumers and the general public is that it's okay for you to ask your, you know, the nurse that comes into the room that assists you at your primary care physician or when you enter a doctor's office and you might have the nurse do some initial tests before the physician walks in. What would you recommend is the best approach on, you know, how does someone ask that? Because, of course, it's it's kind of an awkward situation because you don't want to come off as someone that is this sort of know-it-all of, well, I didn't see you washing your hands and you should really do this because that's that's awkward. You don't, you know, just like you would, you wouldn't tell a waiter that their service is bad before you've really even um, sat down at your table. It is sort of an awkward interaction. So what do you yeah. recommend on how to handle something like that when you don't see someone washing your washing their hands before they start, you know, checking your glands on your neck or, you know, different things like that? Yeah, you know, to tell you the truth, I think it puts the patient in a in a very, very difficult situation because of the power differential. You've got someone standing there, you know, uh, doing perhaps an invasive procedure or something, and I think it's just almost unfair to ask patients to do it. But in some, I think what has to happen is that healthcare facilities have to make it okay for patients to do that. So, for example, I've seen lanyards that staff wear that says, ask me if I've cleaned my hands. So it's really an interaction between the patient and the system. Uh, I've been in situations where I've been up in stirrups and I'm ready to, you know, they're ready to do something invasive. And frankly, um, it's, it's difficult. I'm not sure it's fair to put patients in that situation. But if... Uh, I know because I had it happen to me one time when a patient, a dialysis patient, asked me if I would clean my hands. I will never not clean my hands again in front of the patients, even if I've just done it outside the room. So it's very motivating, but, you, but it is difficult 
uh, we have to make it easier for patients to do that. Dr. Larson, for our infection preventionist colleagues, they have a number of tools to use in their facilities to help increase that compliance. Are there any that you would recommend or what is the latest research in terms of how best for our infection preventionists to help not only get the message across, but determine compliance? You hear things about there's just technology out there. There's the old-fashioned observation, the secret shoppers. Can you shed any light on that, what might help some of the infection preventionists and other healthcare workers become more compliant? Sure. Yeah, I think that there are all kinds of promising electronic monitoring systems, but they're, none of them are, are ideal yet. And certainly direct observation is not ideal either. I think the trick is whatever tool is being used, it's the immediate feedback back to the staff person that's really going to make a difference. So if you have, whether you have direct observation or monitoring or whatever, if staff don't hear the message until maybe a month later and say, well, your hand hygiene rate on your unit was X percent last month, it's meaningless. So I think these... Uh, feedback mechanisms and some even some direct observers are being trained now to in a helpful and positive way tell people when they notice that there was an opportunity to do hand hygiene but they didn't do it. I think the trick is immediate feedback so that staff can um, associate their behavior right now with an outcome that may come later. Otherwise, if they don't get immediate feedback, forget it. Well, and I think one, I believe there was a study done, I can't recall, it was, I believe it was a study, might have been in New York, um, Reka Murthy had done an amazing study regarding um, what her physicians and nurses were touching all over her facility, and she ended up actually doing a swab on all of these common items, and then she, I believe she put it as a screensaver on all of the different computers to show this is how dirty your items are because we're not washing our hands. And I thought, to me, that that is a visual that's going to stick with you. Yeah, I mean, that's a good point. That's another kind of a visual. But nothing takes the place of real time when you're doing something, um, helping people be mindful of what they missed. So it's really... You know, what we don't see is what we miss. And if somebody can help us and we can create this kind of a team idea where we're helping each other do the right thing, I think that's the answer, one of the answers. Now, one thing that we haven't really touched on, and it sounds like such a basic question, but it's the last thing we want to ask before we get into our what's bugging you section is, what exactly is proper hand hygiene? I mean, you know, when I think of when I go out and say I'm trying to rush to the restroom before a movie starts and I'm out at the theater, I, you know, as long as I'm all lathered up and I'm and I'm good, I, I tend to run out the door so that I don't miss my movie. But, you know, is there's I've heard different things like say happy birthday, the happy birthday song twice in a row or it's at least 20 seconds or so. Any guidance on yeah. that? It sounds so basic, but I think we tend to just put a little bit of soap on our hands rub, and then almost immediately put it underwater. I've seen people do that and then rub it underwater and then they just leave. Yeah. No, um, most, I think the average hand wash in the community is about eight seconds. And it's not really possible to cover all the surfaces of your hands in less than, you know, 10 to 15 seconds. So happy birthday twice is what CDC recommends. But that's long. And if you try it, it's like, it feels like forever. So if people say you should wash your hands, uh, and WHO says the same thing for a minute, nobody's going to do it. But uh, there are some studies to show that if you, if you're more mindful, not just of the time, but also touching all the surfaces, because there has been research to show that most people just do their palms, and you miss the part that's touching things most, and that is your fingertips. So if you're mindful of making sure that you cover all the surfaces, that's probably a better way than just singing happy birthday twice or trying to time it. Just make sure you cover it all. Got it. So, Dr. Larson, remind us again what's bugging you about this hand hygiene business? Yeah, what's bugging me is that we haven't figured out yet how to make it 
possible and easy for healthcare professionals to uh, do the kind of hand hygiene that's recommended. Not only quality, not only quantity, the number of times, but also doing it right. Well, Dr. Larson, thank you so much for joining us today. Hopefully everyone, all of our listeners are now very much aware of the ABCs of hand hygiene. I'm Hannah Andrews. I'm Sylvia Quevedo. And if you want to learn more about the research that's out there on hand hygiene, check out ajicjournal.org. Thanks for listening to The 5 Second Rule, produced by the Association for Professionals in Infection Control and Epidemiology staff, including Hannah Andrews, Sylvia Covedo, and the APIC Communications Committee, in partnership with Human Factor. Audio tech is Blake Alvin. Location matters. With options ranging from wall-mounted dispensers and tabletop bottles to hand sanitizing wipes and a single-use sachet, you can place Medline's hand hygiene products anywhere in your facility to make it easy for staff, patients, and visitors to properly follow hand hygiene best practices. Medline soaps, sanitizers, and dispensers empower healthcare workers with hand hygiene formulations that help reduce the spread of infection no matter the test. Boost hand hygiene compliance by outfitting your facility with Spectrum and Cerulean hand hygiene from Medline.